Good morning. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Yeah, happy Sabbath. Yeah, today is a big lesson. We're going to be talking about understanding human nature. And it's more about human nature alive mm -hmm. rather than na human nature uh, after we die, because there is no human nature after we die. My, amen to if, that. You, if you remember last week, we talked about the fall of man and what happened when sin entered this world. This, now we're going to look at Satan's first lie, what happens when you die. So David, would you pray for us? Absolutely. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our loving Father, Lord Jesus Christ and Holy Spirit, we are just in awe of your majesty, of your glory, of the blessings, your um, desire to love us, to give us eternal life, all the things that you do to help us so that we can be saved. Lord, we just bless your name. We glorify your name on this Sabbath day. We ask, Lord, that we are going to tackle a topic that a lot of the world, including myself and others, have been deceived in the past. And we know that Adam and Eve were deceived on the same topic, Lord. Help us, Lord, so that when we study this today, that your Holy Spirit can speak to us in our hearts, that our words can be from him into everybody's heart so that we can understand and like Jesus warned us that even the very elect may be deceived in the end times, Lord. Help us so that as we study this topic, that we can have that understanding and be a guide to others, Lord. Please forgive our sins and be with us as we talk about you. Be with the ones that are coming to church and the ones that will be watching. Guard our hearts, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So our memory verse today comes from Genesis 2-7. And the Lord formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So last week, as we discussed um, the fall, we look, today we're going to look at, at death in respect to what happens when we die. And we see in Genesis 2, 16 and 17 this tension between uh, what God said, you shall surely die, and Satan's counterfeit promise, you shall not surely die. And this was not restricted to the garden, but it, we see this throughout history. And this is, this is one of the major um, un misunderstood truths of the Bible. Many people try to harmonize these words of Satan um, with the words of God, which is, is really impossible to do. So they take this warning, you shall die, and refer it to only the, the perishable body that we have on this earth. And Satan's, we shall not surely die, which gives you an, some kind of illusion of an immortal spirit or soul that's out there. But we're going to find that this approach doesn't work because God's and Satan's words can't be harmonized. They can, there can't be an immaterial soul and spirit that consciously survives after physical death. Through the years, many philosophers and even scientists have attempted to answer the questions of what happens when we die. But as Bible-based Christians, we must recognize that only Almighty God the one who created us and knows us perfectly can explain this. We see in Psalms 139, I'm going to read 1 and 2 and 23 and 4, it says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down, you know my rising up, and you understand my thoughts afar off. Search me and know my heart. Try me, know my anxieties. And if there's any wicked way in me, lead me in the way of ever everlasting. So David's very clear that God knows us better than we know ourselves. So only, one, <clears throat> so only in his word and his scriptures can we find <clears throat> the answer to this crucial question about what happens. 
Ellen White says in The Great Controversy, <clears throat> nowhere in scripture has found the statement that the righteous go to their reward or the wicked to the punishment of their art, of, at death. Patriarchs and prophets have left no assurance. Christ and his apostles give no hint of it. The Bible clearly teaches that the dead do not go immediately to heaven. They are only represented as sleep until the resurrection. And we're going to talk about that at length today as well. So if the Bible doesn't teach that people go immediately to their reward, where did this idea come from? Isn't that interesting? So if you take a look at this, uh, the concept of the soul's suppose, supposed immortality was first taught in two places. I bet you can't guess the first one. Babylon. Babylon and Egypt. And remember, um, Abraham came out of where? Babylon. Mm -hmm. Where did the children of Israel come out? Egypt. Egypt. And so we see these in there. In, we can go back and, and read in some of their books. If you remember, the Egypt, Egyptians had the Book of the Dead. Mm -hmm. And in Babylon, they had the ep Epic of Gilgamesh, where they talk about the fate of the dead in the netherworld. So interestingly, in, um, so it, it, to me, it's, it's really interesting to see that that even back then, there was this awareness of this, this conflict. So God had to bring his people not only physically from these countries, but spiritually as well. So I find that com very interesting. The belief in the immortality of the soul was developed, further developed with, from the Greek thought and chiefly through the philosophy of Plato. Its principal exponent, who was led to it through Orphic and Eleusian mysteries, which were Greek um, religions, and Babylonian Egyptian views were strangely blended. So they took the Babylonian view and the Egyptian view and blended it and came up, voila, with immortality of the soul. Plato, the Greek philosopher, a student of Socrates, taught that the body and the immortal soul separate at death. This platonic idea that the body dies, yet the soul is immortal. Early Christianity was influenced and corrupted by Greek philosophies as it spread through Greek and the Roman world. And by AD 200, the doctrine of immortality of the soul became a controversy with Christian believers. So this is when it really took, took hold. Um, the, evangel the Evangelical Dictionary of Theology notes that origin an early influ in influential Catholic theologian was influenced by Greek thinkers. Speculation about soul in a sub-apostolic church was heavily influenced by this Greek philosophy. And then a little bit later came Tertullian, who was one of the early writers, um, Christian authors, and he, he was very extensive in his writing as a Christian apologist. So we see that through time, everything weaves its way back to Babylon. In this time, you rarely go, you can go to uh, any, anywhere in the world to a Christian funeral, especially, and everyone I've gone to where my friends have passed, they talk about our, our loved ones being in heaven looking down on us. And it, it does, it, to me, it doesn't make any sense because if we're already in heaven, why does Christ need to come and get us? So that, that has always, that, ha, that has never sounded right to me, but this is, is um, this, this belief that, that is out there. So we're going to really get into this topic in the lesson. I want to read to you from the great controversy. Um, if man had been willing to receive the truth so plainly stated in scriptures concerning the nature of man, and the state of the dead, they would see in the claims and manifestations of spiritualism the working of Satan and the power of signs and lying wonders. And so this is, this is really a, a critical piece if we don't understand the state of the dead, that the supernatural 
Satan then uses to deceive us. Because many people talk to um, dead loved ones. Many people um, call um, past from the past from the dead. And so this puts us in a very precarious, on very precarious ground. But back to Ellen White. But rather than yield to the liberty so agreeable to the common heart and renounce the sins which they love, multitudes close their eyes to the light and walk straight on, regardless of warnings, while Satan weaves his snares about them, and they become his prey, because they have not received a love of the truth that they might be saved. Therefore, God will send them strong delusion, so they shall believe a lie. Those who oppose the teachings of spiritualism are assailing not men alone, but Satan and his angels. They have entered into a, upon a contest against principalities and powers and wicked spirits in high places. Satan will not yield one inch of ground. God should be able to meet him, as did our Savior with these words. All right. So next, Mark. Okay. Yeah. It's your turn. We're going to start. And thank you, Barbara, for that uh, introduction. You know, and I think we're going to start about this idea of human nature about how God created us. And we'll <laughs> dig about that and what the, how he did it specifically that gives us an idea that backs up this thought of how, what happens when we die. In fact, I like to say that God created us to be one special being, not two. <laughs> and um, to start that out though, but a special, he created us to be special, we know this. And let's read in Genesis, at the beginning of Genesis, first we're gonna talk about how Genesis chapter 1, how he created animals, and then how he created man, and dig a little bit into this. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 20 to 23, it says, Then God said, Let the waters abound with the abundance of living creatures. Let birds fly above the earth, across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So God created great sea creatures and every little thing, every little thing that moves, with which the water abounded according to their kind, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, and God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas. Let birds multiply on the earth. So the evening and the morning were, on, were the fifth day. At the beginning, he said, Let the waters abound. We're going to also see how this repeats when he creates the land creatures. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creatures according to its kind, cattle and creepy things and beasts of the earth, each according to its kind, and it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. Now, let's see how he created man. A little different wording. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26, it says, then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creepy thing that creeps on the earth. So God created in his own image, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. I want to point out the difference. At the beginning it said, let us make man in our image. First of all, he's saying us, which actually refers to the multitude of the Godhead. It's, it's actually giving a little reference, although not specifically to the Trinity. Um, but th the other one, the other aspect is he created us in his image. How special are we? And he gave us dominion over this place that he created. You know, this is being the sixth day. You know, he spent that time creating this for us. Let's continue on in Genesis chapter 1, verses 28 to 30 and talk about how we're special. Then God blessed them. God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and every living thing, every little thing, living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, See, I have given you every herb that the yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be for food. Also, to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life. I have given every green herb for food, and it was so. 
This is chapter one, talking of the differences between how we are special compared to how we created animals. In chapter two, he goes, he's more specific about actually how the actual verbs that he uses to create animals and how the verbs that he uses to create man. And we're going to dig in specifically on those and also say why we are special. Genesis, and he uses a verb that is talking about a potter and how a, a potter would form clay to make something. And let's read about this in Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 and 19. Then the, and the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Actually, this is giving reference to, to Eve. That's later on. But then he says, Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them in them to Adam to see that he would call them. And whatever Adam called each, each living creature, that was its name. He used this idea of formed. Now we're going to see how he creates man. In our memory verse, Barbara already talked about it. It says exactly that. We're going to read about how. This is our memory verse, chap Genesis chapter 2, verses 7. And God, the Lord God formed man out of dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. The first part, he formed us, just like he did the animals. But the special part was he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. If you look about the verb, the Hebrew verb here is nepesh cheya, if I'm pronouncing it right, which means that we become a living soul. Through the breath of God, we become one living being. We are not given a soul. We become, we've been transformed into that living soul. And this soul is not something that lives external to the body. It's not something that is immortal. We'll read about later. This concept of external soul is a pagan concept, as Barbara pointed out, not a biblical idea. In fact, from Babylon and can lead to dangerous theology. Our Adventist study Bible commentary states the following. The Hebrew verb word for being means life or person, not some eternal separate entity. The Bible is consistent in its discussion of life and death. If life came when God formed humans from the elements of the earth and breathed life into them, as we will learn, death is described as the exact opposite. One way to think about it is that I have this phone here, and if this phone, if it didn't have a battery in it, would just be some silicon, some plastic, some metal, it would just be there. If we didn't have our life inside us, we'd just be ca carbon atoms or so on. As soon as I put energy into it, in this case a battery, it becomes this talking, listening, you know, sound generating device. We become living beings. It's the same idea. God breathing his breath of life into our nostrils. God made us to be one special being, not two. We're going to see how important this is in the next few lessons this week. Thanks. Once that, that current goes away, it just ceases to exist. Exactly. So I, 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 like, that, I like that concept. So um, we're going to move on to, um, David, it's your turn. You're going to talk about, what are you going to talk about here today? The soul who sins shall die. Ah, I hey, like that. Hey, Barbara, you talked about this before. Yes. This is one of the most important topic that as, as, uh, as Christians should uh, at least understand so that in addition to Sabbath command so that we actually um, can explain to people and also be blessed and not be deceived, right? Yeah, this yeah. and the Sabbath yeah. are the yeah. two most misunderstood truths Truth. of the Bible. Yeah. yeah, and Mark, that was a brilliant way of saying without that breath, without that battery, a cell phone is just a cell phone. And, and with it, there's so many usage. And you, as you know, even computers, they may be the same thing, but each computer has its own glitches and identities, right? And I always notice that. So let's dig into this Monday's topic. The soul who sins shall die. I, you know, initially when this Sabbath school lesson came about, I was um, kind of thinking about it. Then finally I realized how important it is because as I talk to people outside you know, other Christian people, 
I realized that a lot of people don't give it a thought because it is so comforting to think that after death, people go to Jesus or there's something going on, not just sleeping there. And people like to believe that. And Babylon, you know, Egypt, yeah, the author of the Sabbath School lesson was talking about how Egypt's whole, li whole goal in Egypt was afterlife, pyramid, you know, and abomination, you know, mummies. So, so God is saying this, the soul who sins shall die. Why is God saying this? Soul, what is soul? Soul is nothing but life on this earth. Soul somehow, some way, it, by most people, they look at it as an entity that is spiritual. And that is not the case at all. Soul is an entity that's in existence and that is our life on this planet. Now the difference between animals and humans, like Mark mentioned, image and likeness. Image is we are kings and priests and likeness is God is long-suffering, abounding in grace, and Jesus said, I desire mercy, not justice. That's the way we're supposed to treat each other. And when we die, we cannot do that, right, Mark? Because we cannot. So how can we, you know, exist? How can we have eternal life after death? We cannot because we cannot represent the image and likeness of God when we die. And so God is saying this because he is the creator of life. So somebody who creates life also gives guidelines. And he says, you know what? I created life, but once you sin or transgress, I'm going to tell you that you're going to lose that life. And, and let's go and read. Uh, this, this, this command is one of the commands that God uh, talked about in Genesis 2, 17, right? Now, let's go and read in Genesis chapter 3, verse 17, when Adam and Eve actually sinned. And what does God say to Adam? Now, a lot of people say, oh, it's... Um, you know, Eve ate the fruit first, and he, she was talking to Adam about it, and Adam listened. But here, God clearly says that sin came from Adam. Okay, let's go and read it. Uh, uh, so Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. The whole earth ground is cursed because of Adam. And then he says at the end, uh, and dust you are, and dust you shall return. So, what is happening here? Here we see that life does not exist when we die. That means there is no soul. Soul is a living entity. Good thing is that soul belongs to God. And that is something I'm happy about, right? Aren't you happy about it? It's not belong to Satan. My soul is not, you know, I don't I own Barbara's soul. Who knows what I would have done with it? But thank God, God has it, right? Because he's loving and he's long-suffering. So uh, some of the, you know, the verses that they uh, talk about uh, here um, in the Sabbath school lesson, um, like Ezekiel 18.4, it says, Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. Ezekiel 18 says that every soul is going to be Every life is going to have its unique identity and is going to be judged accordingly. They will not, one soul's uh, judgment is not dependent on the other soul's judgment. Or one life judgment is not dependent on other life. It's going to be individualized. And it's also talking about how God, in the end, in the third death, third death, the soul, the life of that sinner will be completely destroyed. Matthew 10, 28, it says, Do not fear those who kill the body, but, ca but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who can destroy both soul and the body in hell. And then uh, we know that Mark talked about it. Animals and humans are created from the same ground, but also they go to the same place, right? They also go to the ground. So that means life. It's all about life. Life seeks to exist because Adam was cursed because of the sin. Now, let's not hate Adam. Let's, Jesus said, do not hate the sinner, but hate the sin. So the, the problem here is disobedience, right? So Hebrew word for life, or soul, like Barbara mentioned how the soul was, con that, that translation was corrupted from the Greek culture, and it became something like spiritual. But actually the Hebrew word is nefesh. Nefesh is the Hebrew word. And nefesh means we live as nefesh, we 
Whatever we do, we do it as a nefesh, as a living soul or as a soul. So soul is only alive all the time, okay? If, the, if we're not alive, there is no soul. So what happened when Adam sinned? Two things happened. Sin brought curse, like we read, to the whole earth. Everything is supposed to die, including animals. And also, what's happening is when we die, when we sin, what happens is we don't have any more soul. And how does that happen? Just like the way we are created, the breath of life came together with the flesh. In death, that, that became soul. In death, that soul dissolves when the breath of life leaves the flesh. So there is no more soul again, okay? So physical death is happening here and soul is not immortal, okay? Just, uh, we need to realize that. So, and then in Ezekiel 18.4, the memory verse for Mondays, is God says that all, all living soul who sin shall die. So according to Romans 3.23, Everybody's going to die, right? All have sinned and fell short of the glory of God. So, so what, you know, what, what we really need to realize here is that we need to start living our life, our soul right now, in a way that we are not afraid to die, that we do not feel fear. We need to be confident because as Christians, unless we believe this soul as a living entity, as our life, we cannot rely on Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. We cannot appreciate God. We actually don't even believe in God if we don't believe in the death of soul. And if we ex believe in the, you know, the immortal existence of soul, then we actually are not believing what God said. When you sin, you will surely die. So that is very, very important. Now, we need to know that the soul pretty much is not immaterial. I just need to keep mentioning that it is material it is here it is with us now three of us barbara is a soul i'm a soul and mark is a soul now you know what is interesting is though that what we live on when we live on this planet okay there is the book of remembrance malachi 3 16. god says i write down all your acts on the book of remembrance so our life currently is being written down okay now we soul is not immortalized is not immortal it it it, it destroy you know it, it dies at, at death but our information what we do is with god so that our life later on when it comes up for judgment whether we go in the book of life or not that's with god we need to remember that most people confuse that with soul being immortal that's not the case so that's important and secondly we need to realize that with uh, with with soul we have to really always have, we have to depend on God. The best way to do, to have, uh, thank you, Barbara. The best way to actually realize about the soul, how important it is, is to look at God, Jesus, and Holy Spirit at the same time, because they are all together. Feed our soul, keep us connected with Him, and give us eternal life. Um, Paul says that Jesus. He was resurrected by the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, I am the way, truth, and the life. And God is the giver of life. So all three, for our, for our life on this planet, if we want to not die forever, okay, if we want to resurrect in the first resurrection, we got to start having that relationship with Father God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit daily, every moment. And to me, that is why God gave that commandment. He said, all soul that sin." surely die. So start having that relationship with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We're going to now look at the spirit returns to God. So if you look at, if you really look closely at the um, Genesis 2, 7, when God breathed life into man, he became a living being. I really, David and I are both in healthcare, so this is one of the best CPR jobs ever, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we, be he be we became a, a living being. Yes. So this, this term that we're going to use here, um, that it actually this, this issue of spirit 
is ruah or breath. And so we're going to see this both in Genesis 7.22 and Genesis 2.7. Genesis 22 says, Of all that was on dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life died. So we see this, this, this issue of breath and spirit. And Genesis um, 2-7 then, we, we've already talked about man becoming a living soul. So just as you have the dust of the ground that God did, he breathed life, man became a living soul. You take away that breath, man returns to dust, and man is no longer a soul. He's no longer this living soul. And the, the, the body dies. Ezekiel 8, 4 through 20, God says, Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father, the soul of the Father, as well as the soul of the Son is mine. Those soul who sin shall die. We see over and over, and then in, in t verse 20, it says, The soul who sin shall die. The Son shall not bear the guilt of the Father, nor the Father build it bear the guilt of the son the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself and the wicked of the wicked shall be upon himself so we see that once man dies this this word soul really goes away um and we talk let's look at um this 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 issue again in ecclesiastes three nineteen and 20 for what happens to the Son of Man also happens to animals. We've talked about that, that they, that they die. Surely all have um, one breath. Man has no advantage over animals, for all is vanity. All go to one place, all from the dust and, to re and return to dust. So we, we see this over and over in the Bible. We just keep, I just keep saying that because it's, it's so repetitive that it amazes me that people could be so far off on this issue. Death is nothing else than ceasing to exist. As stated by the psalmist, you hide your face, you are troubled, you take away your breath, they die and return to dust. Psalms, he, he says this in Psalms 104.29. God created humans as a vibrant animated body, not as an incarnate soul. The humans are not created with an immortal soul as an, as an entity within them per se, but as human beings, they are souls. The doctrine is confirmed by later use uh, of this term in scripture by other biblical authors, and I want to I wanna share some of those authors. For example, <clears throat> the, the book of Genesis counts how many persons moved with... Um, with moved to Egypt with Jacob. These persons are called souls. We see that. Genesis 46, 22 says, the sons of Rachel were born to Jacob. All the souls of all the souls were 14. So in all, there were 14 souls that were with them. Genesis 46, 25 and 27 says, these are the sons of Bila and Laban gave to Rachel his daughter. These they bear to Jacob. In all, souls were seven seven souls all souls came with jacob to egypt which came out of his loins jacob's sons and wives all the souls were three score and six do you think god's saying something <laughs> about souls here that they're living and the son of joseph which was born with him in egypt were two souls and all the souls of the house of jacob which came to egypt were three score and ten so we see this we also see luke mentioning this when he talks about Peter's preaching on the day of Pentecost, how many souls were baptized? 3,000. And so we, this, this is uh, what um, Acts 2.41 says. Then they, that, then they that gladly received the word were baptized, and the same day there were added to them 3,000 souls. So we see God over and over uses the living term as soul he doesn't he doesn't talk about that for those who have died and and 
I think David, you're going to talk about that a little bit later. What really happens when we when we when we die? So the body, soul, and spirit function in co close cooperation, revealing an intensely sympathetic relationship among a person's spiritual, mental, and educational facilities. To these aspects, we are we also need to add a social dimension, which may because we are created as social beings. Paul elaborates on this multidimensional aspect of human behavior and explains that as human beings, we need to let God transform us by his grace and spirit. So it's God's spirit that, that, that does this transforming work. May God himself and the God of peace sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless. At the, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thus, everything we are and do must be sanctified by God. Within our existence as humans, we experience life on a physical, emotional, mental, intellectual, and spiritual plane. So we can't, we can't remove this aspect, this whole living being person that we are, um, our, our emotions, our, our, our relationships, it's all the soul that does that. It's not, and, and we know that this spiritual event, this event that we pray or recite a Bible text, social facilities, if we are not alone during the time of our activity because God is with us. So it is only the Spirit of God that keeps us alive. Very good. Mark, do you want to talk about? Yes. So in, um, I'm going to, on Wednesday... Um, and we're going to talk about, you know, I, I wanted to start this out by saying, you know, in society, I mean, you heard, have you guys heard the term, I can sleep when I'm dead? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of out in our folklore, mm -hmm. and, and actually there's a couple pop songs that have this title, mm -hmm. but actually, it's exactly right. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you read in the Bible, we're going to read in Job. How about this, Mark? I'm dead when I sleep. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe so, but I can sleep when I'm dead yeah, is yes. also true. And let's read. Job actually says this in Job 3, and we're going to read from uh, several verses, but Job 3, mm -hmm. verses 11 through 13. Job at this time is, is kind of lamenting his current plight and situation, and let's, let's see what he says here. Why did I not die at birth? Why did I not perish when I came from the womb? Why did the knees receive me, or why the breasts that I should nurse? For now, I would have lain still and been quiet. I would have been asleep. Then I would have been at rest. So here, it's not a, you know, we're talking about death, and, you know, it is a kind of a sobering thought. But we're going to talk about what that, what are we when we die? And right here it shows that we are at rest. And Job is saying, we are at s asleep, okay? This is, a, you know, the statement from Job, the patriarch deplores his own birth because of all the suffering, but he recognizes that if, when he dies, and if he died before, he would remain asleep and at rest. And this is not the only place in the Bible. The Bible is full of this. In fact, very, very consistent. Um, let's read in Psalms 115. Let's read in uh, Psalms 115, verses 16 and 17. Uh, I'm going to skip to 17. The dead do not praise the Lord, nor any who go down into silence. So Psalms talking about the dead, and they're not praising the Lord. Um, defines the location that the fact the dead are kept in a place of silence. And the dead do not praise the Lord. This is different than if you were went up to heaven and hanged out with the Lord, you would think that someone that would, had been faithful and thankful would be able to, you know, to worship God. But that's not the case here. Not yet. We will, we will be up there with him, but not when we die. At this time, we are going to be silenced. Let's read Psalms 146, verses, verses 4. Once again, his spirit departs. He returns to his earth. In that very day, his plans perish. According to this psalm, the mental activity of the individual ceases with death. This is a perfect biblical depiction of what happens at death. As Barbara was talking, the spirit departs. 
he returns to dust, okay, he returns to the earth. Ecclesiastes 9, um, chapter 9, verses 5 and 6. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love, their hatred, and their envy have now perished. Nevermore will they have a share in anything done under the sun. And in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses, 9 and, uh, verses 10, it says, Whatever, you, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. For there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. Both of these passages talk and describe what we do when we die. That there's going to be there's no love, there's no work, there's no knowledge, there's no wisdom. There is nothing. nothing. <laughs> yeah. Daniel. Daniel 12 is one more said. Daniel 12 verses 2 um, says this. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some f to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. So Daniel's talking about the second coming, the second coming and eventually the resurrection. And those that were, that were resurrected come from the earth and were asleep. Daniel 13, 12, chapter 12, verses 13. But you go your way till the end, for you shall rest and will arise to your inheritance in the ends of the days. So we've been talking, you know, kind of, I don't know, you know, about death. And that's usually not a very fun topic, but it does come with some comfort. In fact, if we read in our lesson, it says, the biblical teachings of unconsciousness and death should not generate any panic in Christians. First of all, there is no everlasting burning hell or temporary purgatory waiting for those who die unsaved. Second, there is an amazing reward awaiting for those who die in Christ. David talked about this too. No wonder that to the believer, and this is coming, uh, we're going to quote Desire of Ages, pages 787. Ellen White says, um, to, the, to the believer, death is but a, ma a small matter. To the Christian, death is but a sleep, a moment of silence and darkness. The life is hid with Christ and God. And when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. To us, yeah, we, we do fall asleep. Our, our body returns to dust. Our spirit goes to the Lord. But at that moment when Christ comes back again, we're gonna, to us it's just a moment of silence and darkness. So that sounds fun. I, I can rest when I when I <laughs> when I. Stop. Just a second. It's yeah. just a quick moment. Yes. Okay. All right. I'm, thank you. Sure. All right, David. Resting with our forefathers. Yeah, you know, um, re like uh, Mark, you mentioned that uh, death concept of death to all of us, kind of like a morbid, you know, situation, yeah. hopeless situation. But what's interesting in this, the Thursday's lesson, mm. is talking about rest. Now, you know, like, when we sleep, when you enter into the REM sleep, right? Yeah. Which is your eyes move, your brain activity changes. But before that, there's a stage three sleep where the body changes, you know. Um, so even in REM, we can't, whatever experience we go to bed with, sometimes we have nightmares, right? But we are talking about a rest that is truly restful because there's Rich. nothing. Okay. And that is important here because what is nothing, that means that here we truly, truly are there for a blink of an eye because we are outside time and space. Yep. There's two times we are outside time and space. One is in death and one is in eternal life. Amazing, right? Yeah. So you can never have eternal life without death or death without eternal life. They're connected together. That's why mm. Jesus came and he died and he resurrected. Mm. So they're, they're very intertwined with the creation process because we have the free will that was the original plan. Mm -hmm. So that is to me, it's, a, it's very comforting to know that I will be resting. Yep. And then God says, do not, you know, Paul says, do not be anxious for anything, Philippians 4, but in everything with prayer and supplication and with thanksgiving, you know, give all your thanks to God. So again, I'm glad that God is in control of death and he's in control of life. What can be stressful? That as Christians, we really have to remember that. 
because that is the most important thing. If we love and believe in Jesus Christ, these are, these are irrelevant to worry about. Worry about, again, what? Our relationship with Amen. God, Jesus, and Holy Spirit daily. That's the soul. Okay. Now, let's go and what the Sabbath school lesson says. I want to cover that. Sabbath school lesson mentions, uh, you know, several verses and talks about how different people, you know, in ancient times, family was a big deal because they were nomadic. They were in tribes and things like that. So, like Abraham gathered to his people, his family. Samuel, you know, he was with his uh, family, with his people, Israelites. Kings used to be buried in the tomb with other kings, you know. And what we saw is that when we rested, when they rested, even the good ones and the bad ones, they both rested, okay? It could be anybody, you know, but they all rested. And sometimes there's more comfort in resting in the same family grave. Now, in this day and age, you know, what if I die from a snake bite in Africa and nobody's there, right? Or in Australia. So, you know, or, or die from a plane crash. We may not understand this. So what, what really what's, what's going on here is that um, what's going on here is that we really have to realize that death here in this day and age is very, 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 very morbid. But to God, it is the most important thing for us to show faith in God. So now, let's see what other things the Sabbath school lesson is talking about. He, the Sabbath school also, uh, lesson also said that there's um, people that went before us that died. So we don't need to really worry about it. They're resting. We're going to rest with them. Also, it's talking about how, um, you know, uh, our forefathers did and, and that we are actually uh, going to do the same thing. And it's also talking about a comfort situation. And this comfort situation is important because as Christians, Barbara, are we together as Christians? We're all one people, right? Yes. We don't realize that in this world. We kind of separate ourselves from each other. But if we're Christians, we need to realize that we are one people. So in that sense, resting is so very pleasant and important. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit more about how in practicality about this resting is important and why God wants us to practice resting. Why? Because resting, true resting means cast all our worries on God. So what's the number one resting that we talk about? Is a Sabbath rest, yeah, right? Sabbath yeah. rest. How do we get true Sabbath rest? We rely on Jesus Christ. God gave a seven-year rest. He said on the seventh year, don't plant anything. Let the land rest and rejuvenate. Then there's the 50-year jubilee rest where you forgive everybody's deaths and you restart okay you also we also need to realize that adam and eve when god created adam guess what he said it is not good for man to be alone why because he had no rest there was nobody to talk to and rest so as spouses friends fellow christian members we are to give each other rest it is very important not you know make each other more anxious that is the key okay another thing as christians Let's make each other feel good when they come to church. Give them rest when they come here. Make it a hospital, not a place of, you know, court. Because was, what does Jesus say again? I desire mercy, not justice. So rest really is that starts when we're alive as a soul. We start the rest now, and guess what happens? The rest will be easy at the hour of our death because we are not going to worry about anything. I like what this one verse is, I mean, my time is almost up, but um, Matthew eleven twenty eight to 30, Jesus says that come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So what is, what is, what is, what, what is Jesus talking about? Why is his yoke easy? And his burden light because he lived a gentle and humble life. Yeah. The key for us, because you know in America or when we have more, the more complicated we make our life. But God is saying, Jesus is saying, when we make our life simple and gentle and humble ourselves in the heart, guess what? Nothing should worry us and we'll be easily resting at night, sleeping at night. And God uh, you know, just says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. So friends... We know we're going to have to rest someday. You know, our soul needs to die. But we need to start practicing today. So before the sun goes down today, let's go and find that rest. 
res, you know, make uh, good with people. G let everybody feel the love of Jesus Christ because the true rest is always going to be our relationship with Jesus and our relationship with one another. Hence the Ten Commandments. First four, love God. And the last six, love your neighbor like you love yourself. What better restful you know, way to do things than that, right? Yep. That's it. Thank you. Before we go completely away from your, your topic, I want to make sure we, we talk for just a second about rest. Yes. This, this rest thing as far as sleep goes. Yes. Sleep, because if you look at Kings, you look at, at the, the, the Old Testament. In fact, you can do a study on death just from the Old Testament. That's right. Because the Bible says 36 different times. They slept with their fathers. They slept with their fathers. You showed it to me, yes. Yes. Yeah. 36 times the Bible says that mm -hmm. in the Old Testament. So we want to really realize that when we die, we just go to sleep. Let's go to sleep. Just go to sleep. Yeah. And Barbara, Only we why, don't why, have why, nightmares. Well, we just go to why sleep. Why is that important? Because? It, it's, it gives us just so much hope. I'm going to tell you a story real quick. Please do. We, we've ta we talked about this one time about men, that, that, that when a man dies, he's just asleep in the grave. And one of the ladies that was with us had lost her husband. And she goes, you know, I'm so happy to know he's just asleep. I thought he was up there looking down at me, and it was really creepy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, they, they, if, yeah. you're, if you're not sleeping, you're not resting, you are stressed. Yeah. Because you see all the things going on on this earth. That's right. Yeah. And that does not make any sense. That's so right. everything makes sense biblical. what God does. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Barbara, for that. So I want to I finish with hope, a lot of hope, because this thing of death will not be with us forever. Yep. Um, and often we say that, oh, death is just a part of life. But uh, death really is the opposite. It's the enemy of life. 1 Corinthians 15, 26 says... The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Isn't that good news? Yeah. Ellen White says in Maranatha, if death is the last enemy to be destroyed at the resurrection, we may learn how earnestly believers should long and pray for the second coming of Christ. So we, wanna, we want to pray for that, that coming so that that can be destroyed. And I want to read to you in uh, Revelation 20. Here's what happens. And we're going to look at uh, Revelation 20, 7 through 15. When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for a war. The number is like the sand of the sea. And they came up upon the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints of the beloved city. And the devil who deceived them was thrown in, into the lake of fire and brimstone and when the beast and the false prophet were are also they were tormented day and night forever and ever or until they were burnt up then i saw a great white throne and him who sat on it and from whose presence the earth and heaven fled away and no place was found in them and i saw the dead the great and small standing before the throne and the books were opened and another book was opened which david talked about the book of life and the book of the dead were judged from those things written in the books according to their deeds. The sea gave up her dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up their dead which were in them. So all of these places where people are asleep, God, God lifts them up. Every one of them according to their deeds. The death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And so that there will be no more after that. But anyone who is is found written in the book of life will not be thrown into the lake of fire. So, Barbara, can I read one? Sure. Quick thing. Psalms 139.16. It says, Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and your, in, in your book they were all written. The days fashioned for me, when as yet there are none of them. Friends, there is a book of soul. If there is one, this is it. Soul is mortal. But the information, what we do with our life, is with God from the day we are designed to come to this earth. And it's going to be with Him forever. Yep. Yeah. You know, I think that my last name is, is that 
I read through this, and once again, we learn at the beginning that God made us special. He made us special, and he breathed life and breath into us and created us to be a living being, a soul. And we have this opportunity here, mm. while we're here, to spread God's word, to have that relationship with Jesus on a day-to-day -day basis. And as, as we talked about, give rest while we're here. And at that moment when we pass away, it's just going to be a, for us, it'll be a split second to have that opportunity to see Jesus right away. Absolutely. What a promise. Isn't that neat? Yeah. Let's pray. Dear Father, we're so thankful that you have such a wonderful plan for us, not only in life but in death. And Father, <clears throat> those of us who may go before or may be here at your second coming, we just have that comfort knowing that that sleep that rest will be just for a moment and then we will again see you face to face so Lord, we pray that each day we draw closer to you each day we live a life more like your life lord and that when this day comes we can truly look up and say you are here you are our god you are here to save us and that there will be no more sin or death in this earth thank you for hearing our prayer in jesus name amen um, amen Happy, Happy Sabbath. Sabbath. Happy Sabbath, everyone.